Hello there, it's Tom here, and this is chapter 39 of Gunnar Krieg Court, The Great Secret. Now this chapter is kind of tough to talk about in isolation because it ties in very closely with the next chapter, and also a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to convey, I think, speaks for itself. But the chapter does have some of my favorite scenes in the comic, and there's a few bits and pieces that I'd like to point out and just talk about. So, at the beginning, this is the first time that Annie's really been back to the forest since she spent the summer there. And we can see that her demeanor is pretty different now. She's pretty relaxed and informal with the visits to the forest. And to be frank, she's acting kind of bratty. And this is a problem that Annie seems to have. She gets a little headstrong and careless. And in this chapter and the next one, we'll see that this kind of behavior from her does have its repercussions. But one of the things I like about this chapter is that we get to see Annie and Asengren spending some time together. And at this point, their friendship has really developed to the point where the two of them are pretty close now. The singer doesn't seem much different, but the fact that he's wordlessly allowing her to climb all over him and get so close to him speaks a lot for the way that a character like Sengren has grown to become very comfortable with Annie. And so Annie has been called to the forest by Coyote. And we see also that Annie's relationship with Coyote has changed a little bit too. Again, she's a lot less formal with him. And Coyote's all the more pleased to reciprocate. And even in the way that she talks to him and he talks to her, you can see that she's grown a lot more relaxed in the environment of the forest. And when it turns out that Coyote has just invited her here to tell him stories, she even acts a little annoyed with him and making it clear that she's not impressed with his antics. And of course, Coyote is more than happy to go along with that too, switching from seeming extremely angry to crying and flopping around on the floor. Because for Coyote, these reactions are well within the realm of his character. Up till now, interactions with Coyote have always been quite formal and reverent. A lot of the creatures and people who interact with him do understand that he is an extremely powerful being, but here we can see Annie definitely pushing those bounds. And Coyote's more than happy to just mess around for a little while. And so we get here to something that was hinted at a long time ago in the story, which is Coyote's great secret. And he reveals this in one big page, where I get to do a lot of what I enjoy doing with Coyote, which is him basically changing shape and looking strange and weird and allowing me to do a big page full of symbolic and very dramatic pictures of him. And he claims that he doesn't exist, which by itself is not super interesting, but then he goes into a little spiel where he explains what he means. And this really shows a lot of the underlying rules of nature in the universe that the story takes place in. He spent some time talking about the creation of myths and how the human mind is uniquely able to perceive something as things that it is not, something that, as far as we're aware, animals are not able to do. Coyote's overall point about this being that while human intellect has given the human race things like architecture and artwork and technology and adva- and an advancement in that sense, it also just makes life harder for humans in general, constantly questioning everything around them. And from this general talk, we get into something that is specific to Gunnar Krieg and the physics of this universe, which is the concept of the ether in this world. And it kind of ties into how I treat mythology in the story as a whole. I like to think of stories that have become myths and legends in the past are part of a collective imagination that exists in the world that we can only, in real life, peer into through stories and sharing of this mythology. But here in the comic, Cody points out that all this conceptual stuff is given a very physical representation, and he's not really getting very meta about it here, but I did want to explore the repercussions of something like this existing in this universe, and that's something that will be expanded upon in the next chapter also, since Annie mentions Jones, and Coyote actually asks her to go and talk to Jones about this very topic. And so after Coyote has talked to Annie a little while, she gives him a bit of a telling off about mistreating a Sengren and goes to find him. Because Asengren is quite upset with the, what Coyote was talking about, and here she discovers he feels that Coyote's theory implies that Coyote himself and, and other creatures like Asengren are merely just figments of humans' imagination. But unfortunately for Annie, even just talking about this leads to Asengren basically flipping out. And this is one of the sequences that I really enjoy drawing in the story. Um, I like I like drawing a Sengren in general, but I also like focusing attention on his wolf features and the anatomy of his wooden body. And here, when he's going crazy, I had the opportunity to draw him in all sorts of weird shapes and and, and ways that I don't normally get to, since he's pretty stoic and unmoving. This whole sequence was supposed to be pretty jarring and shocking, because up till now, we've seen a Sengren a couple of times, you know, show anger or use some of the powers of his wooden body, but it's always been done in a sort of restrained way that gets shut down pretty quickly. Here, a Sengren is completely let loose, and showing that he can be quite terrifying. 
if he's pushed to it, in contrast to the beginning of this chapter where he and Annie were very close and friendly together. So another callback to earlier in the story, Annie has to whip out this beacon that Eglamour gave her and snaps it, which allows Eglamour to teleport to her location and then escape with her. And just a side note, this symbol here we've seen somewhere else in the story, and it's a little hint to the to the way that the dragon slayers work and use their powers, which is something that will be expanded upon much later in the story. So they're escaping, but Isengrin is still chasing after him, and Annie is able to use her blinker stone to blind him and allow them to escape. And this leads to Eglamour basically giving Annie a wake-up call, showing that while she's been acting out a little and treating everything very lightly, she seems to have forgotten that these creatures are very dangerous. And Annie's been putting herself into dangerous situations without really thinking about it, which again is another thing that Annie has had trouble with. And so while Annie says that she needs to go off and speak to Jones, and that discussion's continued in the next chapter, we switch back to Coyote and Isengrin, and we see that Isengrin is in pretty poor shape. And while in the past I've kept away from showing behind-the-scenes sequences like this, where we can see Coyote directly meddling with something, here I thought it was a good time to show the reader that Coyote is directly influencing Isengrin. And while he's only given hints of that in the past, we here we can see outright that something sinister is going on, and the thing about Coyote is that he's not acting any differently about it, which kind of puts all his previous actions in this chapter, where he's messing around and being very playful, into a different light. And I wanted to give the reader this information that Annie wouldn't have. And this is just a narrative tool that I kind of enjoy. When the audience has more information than the main character does, and all we can do is just watch as they interact in a situation where we know there is more danger than they are aware of. And that's that for this chapter. And this bonus page is... Mort Funtime. And that's that, so join me again for chapter 40, The Stone.